Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Balancing Heaven and Earth here on the Star Nations Radio Network. This is your show host, Denise Iwana Francisco, and uh, coming at you live from the Enchanted Forest here in Lowell, Michigan. <laughs> it was an absolutely exquisite day, and I'm so happy to be here with each and every one of you tonight as we are beginning to enter into the sacred season, into the holy days. And I'm going to take just a moment to go ahead and feed the live feed on over to Star Nations Radio Network. And if you are so inclined to go ahead and like and share, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And here we go. I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. Hey, CJ, it's good to see you. It's good to have you with us tonight, all of you. And uh, just one more and we are good to go. All of these minor technicalities as we begin the evening. Okay, with that everybody, good evening. It's good to have you with me tonight here on the Star Nations Radio Network and Balancing Heaven and Earth. Oh my goodness. Well, we're starting into the holy days, the holidays, the sacred season, the season of the return of light, gearing up actually for the solstice, the return of light. And we know that uh, that holiday, that holy day, the solstice, the return of light during the winter solstice is a very auspicious day for people all around the world. And it is celebrated in a variety of ways. And with it comes tidings of great good joy and gladness and family and fun and frolicking and all of those good sorts of things. And with it also comes the practicality of being human and the human experience, which says that sometimes during the holy days, sometimes during the sacred days, we can feel lonely, we can feel lost, we can feel alone, particularly, particularly when there's been a death in the family when someone has passed. So tonight on Balancing Heaven and Earth, we are going to talk about death and dying and rebirth and all of those thoughts and emotions and feelings, you know, the personal deaths without dying through the holidays, the holy days. And, you know, so how do we walk through the holy days when someone that we love, who we want desperately to have with us, during these sacred times is no longer with us? How do we feel them? How do we perceive them? And uh, as you know, on Balancing Heaven and Earth, this show is a show that I really like to have as an interactive show. You all know me pretty much, right? And you've been watching me or listening to me for many years or visiting with me at the school. And uh, I'd like tonight to be a conversation, a two-way conversation about, about this particular subject. Good evening, Ellen. Hey, Jocelyn, it's great to have you with us tonight. Marianne, it's good to have you in the house as well. Thank you for joining me. And Connie, Mary Zarowitz. Hey, Mary, it's great to have you tonight. How wonderful, how wonderful. So this evening, I am going to ask that we all begin with some breathing, right? some breathing into our body, into this physical vehicle, that we have some deep breathing, some deep breaths, and exhaling. This past Monday night at yoga, our yoga instructor, Liz, I really, really like her at the hammock yoga here in Lowell, Michigan. She reminded us all in class about the importance of deep breathing and deep exhalations as a means of cleansing our organs, of actually cleansing our liver and our lungs and detoxifying our body. And she she shared a little bit of a factoid that I thought was interesting and frankly made perfect sense to me anyway, was that those people that breathe more deeply and exhale more fully, 
that breathe more slowly throughout their lifetime tend to live longer than people who breathe very rapidly, very shallow, you know, and always on the go, not really paying attention to their breath. So breathing is good for detoxifying. It's good for balancing, for being peaceful and uh, for longevity, apparently. So being mindful of breath tonight, consciously breathing is a good thing. It's a very good thing. So the other thing I wanted to mention as we get going tonight is I want to say thank you to all of you. You know, this past Tuesday, yesterday was Giving Tuesday here in the United States. And so many of you responded to my clarion call for fundraising for my foundation, Gathering Thunder Foundation, that we have raised, oh my goodness, I think between Kelly Spencer, myself, and Lily Vasquez, we have raised, uh, well, with the doubling up of, a lot of it is matching funds, probably well over $3,000 for Gathering Thunder Foundation. And I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to go and to contribute to my Facebook giving page for Gathering Thunder Foundation. Those that uh, donated via my page or Lily's or Kelly's, thank you for that. It's really appreciated. And as you know, 100% of everything that goes into Gathering Thunder Foundation goes right back out into our vital programs and the things that come up at Gathering Thunder. And as an all volunteer foundation, uh, none of us receive a paycheck. We travel on our own dime. We do the work on our own dime because it's all volunteer. So all of the money coming in goes directly out to all of the wonderful programs uh, that we assist with. So thank you all for that. Good evening, Sonia. It's good to have you here this evening. Very good to have you. Let's take a look right here. All right, and thank you to everybody who took the time to, to share the show. Whenever, whenever I have the topic of the evening as death and dying and rebirth, it seems to be a very popular subject. And I appreciate that so many of you say, hey, D, would you talk about this? D, would you talk about that? Can we, can we like sit a spell with that subject? Would you mind doing that? I love that, the fact that you feel comfortable in saying to me, hey, Dana, let's talk about this thing. Let's talk about that thing. And uh, so here we are tonight. Hey, Lily. Hey, Rochelle. <laughs> I love to get the show going and waiting for friends to, to file into the chat. It's very important that we're all here together. Getting the technicalities out of the way up front. And getting down to the brass tacks of the subject. Hey, Rhonda Simon. It's good to see you, Rhonda. What a beautiful group we have gathered tonight. I just finished up with my final clients literally 15 minutes ago, my last clients for the evening. And I have the best clients in the world, I just have to say. I just have amazing clients. And uh, one of the clients this evening was someone who had never been to see anyone like me. <laughs> She's a newbie at it. And she started to ask me some questions about her own visitations, about her own experiences with spirituality, with spiritual phenomena. And in particular, wanting to talk about the ways in which our loved ones, when they cross over, when they go home, the way in which they communicate with us, the way in which they let us know that they are still near. So we're going to talk about that as well. It seems to be a hot topic uh, for people these days, wanting to know that there's something more going on to life than what physically meets the eye. And thank you for that, Ellen. This is a lot of you have seen me over the years wear this piece. This is a Susan Myers piece. Susan who is now deceased, was an amazingly gifted clairvoyant, a beautifully spiritual artist from Indiana, Southern Indiana. And her husband allowed me to purchase this 
several years ago from his from his collection after she passed. Uh, I, I actually have a lot of Susan's jewelry. And oftentimes when I wear it, people will say to me, geez, Dana, that piece is awesome. Well, from what Greg has shared with me, when his wife Susan, particularly when she became very ill, she passed from cancer, she worked very closely with the angelic realm when creating her jewelry. She painted the most amazing oil paintings that are floor to ceiling tall, you know, 10 feet tall, eight feet tall, six feet wide, beautiful portraits of angels, the angels that came to her, particularly as she was getting ready to transition. And this was one of those pieces that Susan created just prior to her transition. Isn't it lovely? It's a heart, it's a wrapped heart. And Greg told me that as she was creating this piece, she was working very closely with the angels. And so whenever I wear it, I feel very close to Susan and I can feel the presence of angels. So I wear this often, often when I'm doing a lot of public speaking, because people will say that they can feel the energy of, of it as well. So thank you for that, Ellen. Hey, Lisa, it's good to see you this evening. Thank you for joining me. Tonight's subject, death, dying, rebirth, the holidays, getting through, knowing that our loved ones are near, and uh, celebrating, celebrating their lives, celebrating without them in the physical world, but celebrating with them from the spiritual realm. This past Saturday, I had the absolute delight of performing the wedding for my nephew. And although my nephew and his wife didn't want a religious ceremony, they wanted a spiritual kind of sort of ceremony, something that was quick, something that was a bit spiritual, not over the top, and certainly not religious in any way. I wrote the vows and I put together the wedding thread and I shipped it off to them. And I received a note back from the bride-to-be, and she said, you know, Aunt Denise, this is beautiful. This is an absolutely beautiful ceremony, but could we please add at the very beginning of the ceremony where you're greeting people and welcoming them to our wedding, would you also make mention of the fact that we're acknowledging our loved ones that are with us tonight in spirit, but who couldn't be with us in the physical can we work that in? And I said, absolutely, we can work that in. And we did. And so during the course of the beginning of their, of their marriage vows, as I welcomed friends and family to the ceremony, I also paused for a moment and invited everyone to feel the presence of the loved ones who couldn't be with us in the physical, but were certainly with us from spirit and in spirit. And afterward, there were a lot of comments from people about how much they enjoyed that, that piece of the opening comments for the wedding was acknowledging the presence of spirit. Acknowledging that our loved ones who pass on have simply passed on to a new way of being, a new way of existing in their spirit body, in their soul body. So, hey, Claudia, it is great to have you this evening on Go the Spectacle, so we can get right down to it now because the glasses are on. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is a time of the year that is so joyful for so many, so many reasons. And here in the northern hemisphere of Grandmother Earth, we're getting ready to celebrate the return of light, of winter solstice. And for others, it's an excruciating time of the year preparing for the return of the light, whether we're celebrating uh, Diwali, whether we're celebrating Hanukkah, Christmas, whatever it happens to be, or none of those things, or none of those things. It can be excruciating, particularly for the very first year of celebrating and having family gatherings without somebody who has crossed over during the course 
of the year leading up to this time. Hey, Michael. Okay. Absolutely. So there, I just kind of covered the screen in that request. So everybody holding in prayer, Keegan, who has been in a horrible accident. So the power of prayer, right? The power of prayer is that it's very powerful. It is a thought stream from our heart and mind that connects to the heart and mind of God that creates this alchemy of love and loving intention. So absolutely we will. We will be happy to do that, Michael, throughout the course of the evening, holding Keegan in healing prayers, prayers for wellness and restoration. You are very welcome, Michael. Yeah, this is part of why we gather on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday evenings is to talk about these things. The Christmas holiday, particularly here in the United States, I was just having a conversation. Oh, with Megan Nutto. Meg and I were just talking about this, how Christmas has morphed over the years and how it's really become something very different than when she and I were little girls in the 60s and the 70s, how it's become almost um, Melba toast in some ways with regard to the sacredness, with regard to ritual and all of those those sorts of things. And we were talking about, did we believe maybe that the holidays or the holy days as we've known them since the 60s and 70s when we were little kids, did we think that they were going to continue to become something different? To maybe become something more all embracing or all inclusive? I happen to believe that that's happening in a lot of in a lot of families, in a lot of communities, that there is a wider embracing of what are the holy days? What is sacred? And trying to understand what is sacred and holy to another person, becoming educated about what is sacred and holy to someone else. Part of that sacred and holy, I believe, and the education of it, is in understanding that this physical life that we are living is very, very fleeting. And I know that there are people out there, maybe there are people who are watching me right now that are thinking to themselves, what are you talking about? People are with us in spirit. Denise, that's hogwash. People, when people die, people die. You know, I've met people that have that belief system, that grew up in that belief system, thinking that when you are dead, you are dead. That is the end of the story. Well, I've never understood that to be true because ever since I was a little girl, I knew something was different because I could see people who were supposed to be quote unquote dead. And I knew it wasn't my imagination. And I knew that it wasn't something that I'd seen on TV because again, really 1967, how many choices were they in night were there in nightly TV? Well, there were very few choices in nightly TV. So when my mother used to say, you must have watched something on TV. Well, I knew that Walter Cronkite was not talking about seeing dead people. And I knew that Lawrence Welk, he wasn't talking about it either. And it was never mentioned on the wonderful world of Disney either. It just wasn't. So I knew that there was something going on. And it took a lot of years to find out what exactly that was. For me, I refer to it as the charismata, the gifts of the spirit. That is a definition that was given to me by, you know, I grew up Catholic. So at 30 years old, being told, you know, Denise, uh, what you're displaying, what, what you've got going on here, Denise, are the gifts of the spirit, the charismata. And so after all of this testing and all of those good sorts of things, um, you're a sensitive, you're a seer. So that's what it's been all of these years. I'm a sensitive, I'm a seer. And you know what? If you're watching me tonight, you may very well be a sensitive or a seer as well. There is a difference between being a psychic and being a medium. There is a difference between being a psychic and being a medium. A psychic can pick up on impressions, energies, maybe thought forms, etc. Uh, bits of information here uh, can see information that does not mean that they are able to communicate with the other side of the veil. And so some people are psychic mediums. The word psychic means of the soul. So it is a charism or it is a gift of the soul. That word psychic means of the soul. 
That's what we're talking about on this show. It's the soul. How do you balance having a human existence when you've got a soul that's got stuff going on, right, in the spiritual realm here on the earth plane? All right. And that's what we're going to get to right now, I do believe. Molly, can you become aware of dead people or is it it's, or is it something you are born with? That's the conversation I had with my, well, my second from the last client tonight. Well, for myself, I was born this way. I was born with this ability to see people who no longer inhabit their physical body. And so for some of us who are born that way, we are born as mediums. In other words, we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can taste, we can feel all of that. See people who are no longer in their physical body. And other people grow into the ability and other people yet have spontaneous experiences of perceiving those that are no longer in their physical body. So the answer to your question is yes, yes, yes. Sometimes it's something that we mature into. Sometimes it is something that happens when someone we love who has crossed over comes to visit to let us know that they are okay, they are safe, they are well on the other side of the veil. Maybe they come to us to let us know that they're earthbound, that they need prayers, that they need assistance. They've not fully crossed over. Some people remain a little bit earthbound for a while, some people for a very long time. And so people who are sensitive or seers will often be visited by those that maybe are earthbound um, and need some assistance. But most often uh, people are visited by those that they love who have gone home and wish them to know that they are okay. That is a great question, Molly. Lisa is saying, this is the first Christmas without my mom. Aww. It's especially difficult because my mom was all about Christmas, decorating every room, opening her house to everyone. She was so loving and amazing. I'm trying to think of a good way to honor her. Oh, bless your heart. Oh, yeah. everybody in the stream, we have our friend Lisa who is asking this question, what is a good way to honor her mom? What might you suggest to her? One of the things that I have suggested over the years is particularly like with a mom that was really into Christmas, and especially if your mom loved to make the Christmas cookies and to make Christmas dinner and do special things for Christmas, one of the things that I would suggest is to follow mom's recipes and to make those things that she would love to have baked or to cook for her family or to have available during the holidays. Do that. There's an alchemy there. I wish Kelly Spencer was on here right now because Kelly could talk about this as our Cooking with Kelly Alora's Way specialist. There is an alchemy, Lisa, when we use great grandma's recipe particularly if great grandma's recipe was one of those secret recipes that wasn't handed out very easily. There's an alchemy when we take the recipe out and we begin to prepare by bringing all of the items together and we begin to mix and blend and to prepare. Why? The alchemy is in this. The alchemy is in all of the things that we bring together, the sugar, the flour, the roast, the herbs, all of those sorts of things, whatever it happens to be. And the other piece of the alchemy is this. It's the memories that are evoked when we smell, you know, Aunt Nancy's famous Swedish cookies, right? The powdered sugar cookies. Or when we smell the dumplings that... Uh, grandma used to make. When we smell when we cook, when we taste when we're cooking, there's an alchemy of emotion, of memory. And in those memories and in those emotions, we bring in the love of, in this case, it would be your mom. If she loved to decorate the tree, 
to put some of her favorite things on the tree or to have some of her favorite Christmas carols playing and singing along with those Christmas carols. Because again, it's the alchemy, it's the memory, it's the emotion. One of my dad's favorite Christmas songs was Dean Martin, It's a Marshmallow World. And I still love that song. I love Dean Martin Christmas songs. And so last year was my first year without my dad for Christmas. And I was decorating the Christmas tree upstairs one day, adding a few more ornaments. And I turned up that song, Dean Martin. It's a marshmallow world made for sweethearts, you know? And I was singing to it and I was hanging. Of course, the tears are coming down as I'm hanging and singing the song, really getting into it. And I could really feel my dad there listening to Dean Martin, singing along to Dino with me while I was hanging those ornaments. So when we think about how do we bring our, our loved ones in, including our four-legged loved ones, because sometimes it's a first holy day without our four-legged or our feathery family member, we can do some of those favorite things as well. What was their favorite toy? Maybe hanging one of those toys on the tree and playing the Christmas carols and thinking about them, not avoiding. So many people want to avoid the emotion of grief or the emotions that come with walking down memory lane. I say embrace those, particularly the first year or the first couple of years. Play those Christmas carols, sing those songs, dance around the Christmas tree, make those recipes because from spirit deep within us and spirit all around us. It draws our loved ones near. Think about this, particularly when it comes to cooking. If you are making a recipe that belonged to your mom, that belonged to her mom, that belonged to her great aunt, think about all of the ancestors then that are going to be drawn in by the smells, by the memories, right? And the joy of all of that. What a great question, Lisa, holding you in love and light. Look at all these wonderful suggestions. That, oh, well, thank you for that, Cheryl. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing very well with all my glasses, so I have to pull it up on the screen to see. Okay, great question, Marilyn Lewis, my friend Marilyn from the great state of Wisconsin. Can you be born with it and then not want to see it? So. Oh, and ask not to see it and therefore shut it off. Yes. And actually, there are a lot of people who do do that. I have met particularly people my age and just a bit younger and, of course, older than myself, who remember as a kid having experiences with being able to see those that have crossed over, with being able to see imaginary friends, with being able to see angels and guides and all of those things. But perhaps they were told that it was wrong. Perhaps it went against their particular re religion or faith-based community, that it wasn't understood. A lot of things happen. Sometimes what happened for little people and still happens for young people as well, is that maybe the parents don't understand it. Maybe the minister or the imam or the rabbi or the satguru, maybe they don't understand it. And so they're told to put it on a shelf, not to talk about, it. don't talk about that. Minister doesn't understand that, satguru doesn't understand that, imam doesn't understand it, rabbi doesn't get it, don't talk about it. And so for a young person, then oftentimes all of those um, thoughts and feelings bring us to a place of shutting down. And so we unwittingly or sometimes purposefully shut down our natural gifts and abilities to hear, see, smell, sense the realms of spirit where we came from, home, from home. So yes, absolutely, Marilyn, that does happen. And unraveling that, reweaving that 
can take time. In fact, it should take time. There are those people that rush headlong into wanting to open up the gifts, maybe that are not particularly natural to them. And the outcome and the repercussions of doing that are enormous, enormous. Blowing the pineal wide open in various sorts of ways, typically with drugs and things. Um, hallucinogens is, yeah, I don't recommend it. So great question. And here we have Kelly Spencer and Kevin Spencer and Coda <laughs> and his big sister. <laughs> Kelly, question. Our friend Lisa asked about, you know, what's a good thing to do to um, remember mom during Christmas? Her mother passed away this year. And so she's asking the question, you know, what can I do at Christmas time? to remember mom and I suggested maybe cooking her favorite recipes or um, baking her favorite recipes because my thought Kelly was that you know in cooking and in baking we're using the alchemy of our sense of smell and taste and memories and emotions to bring our loved one closer to us in the kitchen at the dining room table. And, and Kelly, if you would share what your thoughts are about that, I would really appreciate that. I was hoping that you were going to come on and talk about that because you know this is this is your wheelhouse, as they say. So I'll wait for you to respond. Marilyn is saying it was looked at as scary and I was scared. So how do you turn it back on? Okay, so all of you that are listening to me right now. And you're kind of intrigued by this subject of death and dying and rebirth and the holidays and all of those kind of things. And maybe you did, like my client this evening, grow up having experiences of hearing uh, voices in your bedroom, hearing voices in the living room, feeling somebody sit on your bed, feeling the presence of somebody around you in your bedroom or in the living room or wherever you happen to be. And you're wondering, Denise, was I making that up? Was I imagining it? Whatever it was, it scared me. So I, I, you know, sent up this prayer that said, please don't ever let me be scared like this again. I'm scared. I never want to experience this again. That happens. Sometimes when people are frightened, uh, their first prayer is, please don't ever let this happen to me again. I am scared. And then as we get older and we mature, I get the question, as I did this evening, and I'm now getting from my friend Marilyn, can you turn it back on? And if you do, how do you do that? Well, you can turn it back on. I like to look at it as allowing, allowing the experiences to have it, to have it and to happen allowing ourselves to have those experiences and allowing the experiences to happen. How do you do that? Well, first and foremost, oh, Marianne, thank you for that. Sending loving light uh, for Keegan. Thank you for that. Everybody's holding Keegan in love and light. So for those of you that have turned it off, those of you that are just beginning now to experience these things, what do you do with it? My client tonight was like, Denise, I don't know what to do. I grew up Catholic. Nobody explained to me about any of this kind of thing. It just kind of happened and nobody wanted to talk about it. It wasn't encouraged necessarily. Now what? Well, one of the first things that you need to learn to do is to be in balance. To be in balance. To have really good boundaries in your life because as above, so below, as without, so within. The gifts of the spirit, clairvoyance, the ability to see, clairaudience, the ability to hear, clairsmesience and clairgustience, the ability to smell and taste spirit, clairsentience, the ability to feel spirit is very, very, very real. It is very real. Nobody has to ask me the question, Denise, do you think that that's real? Really, do you think? No, I know that that's real. I have 55 years of experience with all of those things. All of those things. And when we are beginning, just beginning 
or re-beginning, rebirthing back into our gifts, it's very important that we do so with really good boundaries in our life. Because, I remember Sonia Choquette, when I was 30 years old, I went to Sonia Choquette's house in Chicago, and I was sitting in her living room with her, and then I was sitting in her library with her. And she said to me, you know, you really need to stop being so nice to just every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes into your life. I said, well, what do you mean by that? I like to be a nice person. She said, well, being a nice person is one thing, but you need to have borders. You need to have boundaries because if you let every Tom, Dick, and Harry do whatever they want in your physical life, that's exactly what's going to happen in your spiritual life. You have to have good, safe boundaries with people, places, things, and situations in your physical life in order for that to extrapolate into your spiritual life. So number one, good boundaries. If you are the doormat for everybody, right, as she was saying to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in your life, just be good, be good, be good, be good to everybody to your own detriment, the same thing is going to happen in your spiritual life. So first and foremost, making sure that you are taking good care of your boundaries, also making uh, time for yourself, for meditation, contemplation, prayer, whatever, yoga, quiet time, very important. Great question, Marilyn. Because if anybody just thinks that I just get up every day and I don't do any of those sorts of things, that's wrong. Every day, every day of my life and throughout my day, there are times of prayer where I just stop and I talk to the creator. It's not like every 15 minutes I whip out my rosary. You know, there are times when I do a rosary. Uh, usually those are at funerals. I'll bring my rosary. I collect rosaries, but it's not something that I do every day. I don't take out my chanupa every day, my pipe every day. There are times that I bring out my chanupa and my pipe and I pray with it, but not always. However, I do every day during the course of my day have lots and lots of conversations with the creator. Sometimes it's as simple as this. Okay, so um, what is it that you want me to do today? Is there somebody that I need to see today? Is there somebody that needs my prayers and my love today? Is there somebody that I need to reach out to today? And I wait for the inspiration. Sometimes the prayers throughout the course of the day are very typically this. Thank you. Thank you for my life. Thank you for the friends that I've been given. Thank you for the experiences in my life. Thank you for all of the people in my life and for what they've taught me. For what they've taught me to be and what they've taught me not to be. So prayers of gratitude, prayers of here I am, Lord, that kind of a prayer. How, how to best utilize my gifts and talents. And sometimes the prayers are just prayers of absolute silence and breath. So throughout the course of my day, that is my practice. That is me walking the red road for myself. So we need to have, when we are deciding to really unfold our gifts, to explore them more deeply, or to reopen them, to have good boundaries in our lives, and to make time every day for conversations with spirit. The best conversation with spirit is thank you. Show me. Give me a sign. How may I serve? And then to listen. A lot of people pray like this, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Thank you for bringing me um, that new snowmobile, and thank you for that bringing me this, or geez, I really need this. They never stop to smell the roses and to be in the essence of the creator and the creator and our guides and angels and the response to our conversation. So it has to become a practice. How do you greet the day? How do you greet the day? That's a good one. Anybody out there, how do you greet the day? A haka oyate, the Elk Nation, teaches us that every day is a love song from the Creator. Every day is a love song from the Creator. How do you greet your day? I can tell you how I greet my day. 
before my eyeballs are even popped open in the morning, I have already said thank you for this day. And I might know that I'm going into a meat grinder of a day. I may know that on the docket for my day are things that are not particularly pleasant, but I always say, thank you. Thank you for this day. Always. And I go from there. So how do you greet the day? That's part of the practice of the spiritual practice. What do you do, to, do during the course of your day? What are your thoughts during the course of the day? Do you have a sacred space in your home? Do you have a sacred space outdoors? When we are walking with the gifts of the spirit, the charismata, or the medicine gifts, whatever you call that, there are so many names for, you know, gifts that we've been given by God, by creator, by the great mystery, Wakantanka, so many gifts that we've been given. How do you walk with them? Or do you just take them out when you want them? Well, I need that for today. So for today, I'm just going to be, you know, more prayerful than I was yesterday. Well, that's a good thing. But if you really want to walk with your gifts of the spirit, if you really want to walk that life, you have to walk that life. You have to walk that life with intention every day. It's not a weekend warrior kind of thing. I'm hoping that I'm making sense to all of you in this moment. Okay, hey, Pauline. Hey, Pauline. Gee, the other day, who was in my house? Somebody was in my house the other day, Pauline, and asked about two of the paintings that I have here in my home that you created, that you painted. Oh my goodness, that lioness that's on the dining room wall. And I believe it's the fox. Somebody was saying, oh my goodness, Denise, those are amazing. I said, my friend Pauline from Bay City, she did those. Sandy Herrick, if you happen to be watching, Pauline is the artist that painted your beautiful bracelet that I gave to you for your 75th birthday. It's good to see you in the house, Pauline. Kelly Spencer is saying, absolutely. That was exactly where I was going. Honoring your loved ones through baking or cooking will connect you on many, many levels. As you begin mixing, kneading, allowing your memories to come, the connection with your loved one will begin. Ah, then the aromas hit another part of your senses. Also, I use my mother's and grandmother's dishes and utensils. I know that your loved one will feel you and you will feel them. It is so beautiful. Thank you for adding that, Kelly. Yes, one of the ways that we can include our loved ones to embrace them is to use their china or their old cooking utensils or their baking pans or to set their pipe out, you know, if they were a pipe smoker or any of those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Bring out the old Christmas ornaments. Thank you for that. Yeah, Janice is saying Pauline's paintings are beautiful. They are. Pauline is an extraordinary artist. Actually, she heralds from the UK, from England. Barbie Cornell birthday girl. I let the dogs out at 4 a.m., looked up at the stars and said, hey, God. <laughs> oh, she was answered with a shooting star. I love my life. Now, if anyone thinks that that's a coincidence, that is not a coincidence. So I can see Barbie, right? <laughs> with Sir Poops a lot, probably, right? Letting him out at 4 a.m. under the starlit sky, saying, hey, God. And a shooting star shooting across the vast expanse of the sky. That's a sign. That is a wonder. That is a moment of grace. That is a moment of absolute grace. Some people will say, gee, there's a shooting star. Other people know intrinsically spiritual people, soul people, people living from their soul. No, thank you. What a beautiful sign. Yeah. Oh, goodness. All right, let me have a little look here at what else is going on. Want to make sure that I'm able to. Can you all still see me? Apparently Rhonda lost me. You could let me know if you could still see me. That's great. So this evening, we're having a great conversation about all of this. Grace. 
Oh, thank you for that little sister. Yes, Grace, an absolute gift in every way, on every level. You know, really the way that, on every level, I like that. Just hit me right there for a moment, Grace. There are so many moments of grace in our lives. There's so many moments of grace in our lives. Even pausing for a moment, and I know, I know, I think I know Barbie well enough to know that in that moment, Barbie paused. She probably laughed to herself, <laughs> you know, with that great laugh that she has. In the moment of grace, saying thank you, or in the moment of grace and saying silently, yeah, yeah, that's a prayer. To me, that's a prayer. That's an acknowledgement of grace of a moment of absolute exquisite synchronicity, of soul synchronicity. Yeah. And the more that we give thanks for those times in our lives, the more moments of grace we have. The more moments of grace we have. Long time ago, this thought came to me that when the seer begins to see with an open heart and mind, all that the seer sees begins to see the seer. In other words, the more that we see grace, the more that we see the divine synchronicities and pause for a moment in our own way to acknowledge them, those moments of grace begin to see that we're recognizing them. And those moments of grace become more frequent they become more expansive. And some of them are those moments when you simply, it's one of those moments where you say, you had to be there to believe it. You had to see it to believe it. You had to see it to believe it. Those moments when people, my dad always used to say to me, Denise Lynn, honey, I don't know how you do it. How all of these things happen to you. And I said, because you know, daddy-o, you taught me at a very young age to live life like it's an adventure. He did. The Sarge taught me that. Life is an adventure. Get out there and live it. Live every single ounce of your life for as long as you have that life. Get out there and live it. And in those moments of recognition of divinity, of grace-filled moments, joyful moments, stop for a moment and say, thank you. I see the grace within you. I see the sacredness within that moment. I happen to also believe that every encounter that we have with another living being is a holy and sacred encounter. How often do we stop to think about that? The more that we come to understand that those that we love who have gone home to spirit still exist, for some people that is a very new idea. Now I know it isn't for any of you that are watching right now, CJ is saying something, but for some people, this is a very new concept. My client tonight said to me, Denise, what am I supposed to do with this? Knowing that I can see that I have visitations, that I can sense things. What are we supposed to do with it anyway? And my response to that was to be open to allowing your expression, your gifts to be expressed as they are called to be expressed, such as, you know, we're entering into this season. Maybe like Lisa, this is the first holy day season where maybe a friend is experiencing the loss of someone who won't be at the dinner table. Maybe a coworker. And maybe that coworker, maybe that friend says to you, you know, hey, Carla Joe, maybe this is going to sound a little strange, but, you know, the other day I was putting up the Christmas tree or I was getting, you know, all of my Hanukkah preparations out or my Diwali preparations out. And I felt for sure that I could feel my father. In fact, I could smell my father's cologne. Carla Joe, is that even real? Can that really happen? 
One of the greatest gifts that we can give one another is the acknowledgement that yes, that is real. Yes, that can happen. How does it happen? It happens because love is an energy. Love is an energy. It is, in my estimation, the most powerful energy that comes out of the heart and mind of God from the central intelligence of the universes of the universes. Call it what you will. That thing that we call love is so potent. It is so strong that not even the loss of our physicality can diminish love because it's an energy that goes on. This physical body, it doesn't go on. The love, it goes on. And it's on those threads. It's in that weave, as Amantha Murphy would say, that we are able to stay connected with those that we love. The two-legged kind, the four-legged kind, the creepy crawlers, the feathered ones, all of them. That's how it happens. We don't have to get into a great big long dissertation about anything other than love. The energy of love. And I'm pretty sure most people understand the potency of love. Some people love their animals more than they've ever been able to love a human being. Some people don't understand how I can love my animals so much. How can you have all those dogs and horses and I can't imagine not having them. I love them. I often say my little five pound Yorkie, Merlin, I don't even think he weighs five pounds anymore. I said to Todd last week after we were out farting around with the horses, I said, Todd, isn't it amazing how we can love a little five pound Yorkshire Terrier as much as we love one of our thousand or so pound horses? This little bitty little old man <laughs> five pounds, how it's not the weight, it's not the size, it's the love, right? I love that little Marilyn, all five pounds of him, and I love all 1,600 pounds of my horses. It's love. It's love. That is the bond. One of the things, Marilyn, to, to go on about what you've asked and what Kelly is saying is this. Love is really the weave or the tapestry that helps us to see more clearly. And I'm going to, um, hello, Mary. Yeah, oh, thank you, Carla Jo. They are Mary Ann. Oh, I love reading all of these comments. <laughs> Aunt Connie. Oh, and Pam is saying animals were my first love. Me too. Little baby dachshunds. Yeah, I had a little dachshund dog named Duchess. I gave birth and I wanted to keep all those puppies. Oh, I was just devastated watching those puppies leave. Love. Let's get back to love here for a minute. How does love figure into all of this? There is an ancient teaching that I think really is just like a common sense teaching, frankly, honestly. When we can look at any living thing, whether it's a five pound Yorkie, whether it is a squirrel in the back that is eating well, if you've been to my home, you know that we feed the squirrels, we feed the groundhogs. If it has mouth and it has teeth and it needs to eat, Todd and I feed them here in the Enchanted Forest. This is a sanctuary, and I love every one of them. Most of them have names. I name them. Okay, so when I can look at a woodpecker, when I can look at a groundhog, when I can look at Scotty, our fox out in the back, with love, not just, hey, look at that fox. When I can look at the fox, the groundhog, the birds, the squirrels, whatever it happens to be, with love. 
there's an alchemy that happens. There's a bond that's built. People wonder, how can somebody be an animal communicator? It's that matrix of love. Animal communicators don't just like animals, they love animals. They have a soul connection, a loving soul connection to animals. That is how they are able to communicate. It is through the weave of love that we receive in our noodle, right? In our synapses, that electrical wonder of our brain, the electrical wonder of brain cells within our heart, let alone the electricity of our soul. It's like, you know, when you have a really good friend and you know what they're going to say before they say, or you know how they're feeling and they're not in the room, they're state, two states away. But you know what they're feeling, you know, oh my gosh, I better reach out today. Like today I was signing more books, I was signing more copies of prayers and incantations and mailing them out. And I just had this sense, call Sandra Herrick. Pick up the phone and call Sandy. Well, Sandy's a busy chick, so what I did was I texted her first, and within a half a second, she was calling me. We needed to talk. She needed to hear from me. How does that happen? It's a bond. It's a love bond. How is it that I am able to see spirit, the angelics, other spirits, those that have gone home? It's with an, a, how do I want to say this, non-judgment. It's unconditional. It's with love. One of the things that we learn as seers, well, for myself, I have been in practice. Since I've been in professional practice as a seer since 2000 when I created my company. The temple within. Before that, I was preparing myself. Thank you, Sister Irene and Sister Joellen, Sister Andrea, for helping to train me, and all of the magnificent teachers since that time. I have the best teachers in the world. Just as people are more comfortable speaking to you when you are non judgmental in the physical, right? Nobody likes to have a conversation with somebody that they know is judging them. None of us do. Who wants to walk into a room and be met by somebody that you know is already judging you by the way you look, the way you're dressed, what you drove up in, how they feel about what you do, whatever it happens to be, nobody. I learned a long time ago that people cross over in many manners and in many ways. And I also learned that we are all human. We came here to have a human experience. We did not come here in the perfection of our being to have a, an experience of perfection of being. We'll do that when we're out of this body. Right? And so one of the things that I'm, what I'm saying here is if you want to perfect your practice as a medium, as a seer, is don't have judgment about what it is or who it is that you are seeing. Love them. If you want to begin being an animal communicator to understand the animal realm, build a bond of love, not just, gee, aren't they cool? Have thoughts and feelings of love. Sometimes when people come to see me as a seer, those that come in from the other side weren't maybe exactly Mother Teresa. Because, you know, what? we're having a human experience. Not everybody's perfect. Not everybody lived the perfect life. And sometimes the circumstances surrounding their departure from the earth plane, that isn't pretty either. If I am going to judge what it is that I'm going to see or be, be presented with, Ain't nobody going to step through from the other side so that I can judge them. They're already judging themselves. We're a fine judge of that in the physical and the non-physical. We do a great job of that all the way around. Our consciousness does. If, however, I am open and loving and non-judgmental, the clarity of my interaction with spirit is going to be more pristine it's going to be more valuable and meaningful. 
sometimes people will say to me, I don't understand why my loved one doesn't come through. You'd think that they'd want to come through. I mean, come on. You'd think they'd want to come through. Well, why do you say that? Why do you think that they would want to come through? Well, because you know what? They were a horse's ass while they were on the earth plane. You'd think they'd want to come through and apologize. To which I respond, I don't think anybody really wants to come through to somebody who still, fe still feels that they're a horse's ass and that they need to come through and apologize. Well, they were a horse's ass. Well, they're not going to come through if you're holding that energy. How about holding the energy of while they were here, um, it was a challenge, wasn't always good. Maybe they did the best that they could do. And uh, maybe I just need to love their soul and love their spirit and try to understand, try to understand the walk that they walked that led them to be a horse's ass. Having compassion, having an open heart invites the presence of. So when people say, geez, Denise, I didn't think about that. No wonder they don't want to visit me. Well, they probably wouldn't want to visit you in the physical realm if you were thinking those thoughts about them. And I hope that what I'm saying, creating a loving atmosphere is huge. For those of you that are watching tonight, and maybe your loved one who crossed over, maybe they were a horse's ass. Maybe they weren't easy to get along with. But now that they're gone, they will be missed at Hanukkah, Christmas, birthday celebrations, Easter, any of those sorts of things. What do you do? Well, you keep it honest. You keep it real. And part of the honest realness is this. Maybe they weren't the kindest person. Maybe they did have a rough patch. Maybe they were awful in their humanness. And maybe the best that we can do during our first holiday without them is to sit and think about what their life was like, to focus on the good memories, even if it's only one little memory, And maybe that will bring them closer. Some people have better relationship with their loved ones after their loved ones are out of their physical body. I've seen that. I know that to be true. And sometimes those that are out of their physical body are able to be more loving while they are not encased in physicality. I can't tell you how many times I hear this from the other side, Denise. Boy, while I was there, I was a real monster. I was so hard on my kids. I was so difficult with my wife. I never told anybody that I loved them. I didn't hug people. I wasn't even nice to my dog. And now that I look back on it, God, I wish I wasn't so hard on my kids. I wish I wasn't so difficult with my wife. And I wish I would have took a moment to be kind to my dog. And now I'm doing the best that I can do from this side of the veil. While I was in my physical body, Denise, I didn't know what it was like to give love because I never received love as a kid. So I did the best that I could do. I'm doing the best that I can do from spirit. All of those things happen. So even when a difficult friend or relative or whomever crosses over, how do you honor them? Well, you're not obligated to honor anybody. You're not obligated to pull up the empty chair. You're not obligated to hang their Christmas ornaments any longer if they were rotten. <laughs> they, yeah. You're not obligated to that. However, however, if there is something within you that wishes to honor the good memories, then think the good memories. Honor the good memories. Do those things. You know, when my father passed, when the Sarge died, I went through a big old stack of photos. A lot of them I threw away. And I noticed that the ones that I kept, the ones that I loved the best, were the ones when I was a very little girl, around six, seven, eight years old, before my dad went to Vietnam. I call them, looking back on it, the pre-Vietnam photos. Those of you that are Vietnam veterans, those of you that are related to a Vietnam veteran, you know that there is no Vietnam veteran that came home the same. 
and it's probably the true for all true for all veterans my realm of reference is vietnam and so when i look around my house of the photos that i have of him and the way that i include him it goes back to before that when dean martin was singing it's a marshmallow world those are the memories i love to have with me those are the memories that bring in the spirit of those times those times because it brings up those memories and emotions within me and if they're rising up from within me they're then all around me so we can choose we can make choices Kelly is saying, I know our love imprints. For example, my grandmother loved to cook. And when she cooked, she put her love into the food. Oh, there, that's very important. We all felt her love as we ate her food. It nourished our bodies and our souls. But her love imprint is in her dishes, her apron, etc. I feel her in all of it. Isn't that beautiful? And I know that one day, you know, granddaughter Lucy will be saying those things about her grandma Kelly. This used to belong to my grandma Kelly. And my grandma Kelly used to make birthday cakes when she was wearing this. And I can still feel grandma Kelly in this kitchen and in these mixing bowls. Yeah. Yeah. Our loved ones are always around on some octave, on some level, and they show us in a variety of ways that they are with us. Most often we can feel them. Sometimes we have visitations. They come and they visit with us. They sit on the edge of the bed. We can hear them say our name right out loud. Sometimes we dream about them. Sometimes we can hear them right in our head. We can hear them. They can hear us too, by the way. If you are somebody who every day gets up and says hello to somebody that you love who has passed on, guess what? They can hear you. They can feel your love. They can hear your love. During this course of the holiday season, whatever that is for you in your own tradition or non-tradition, whatever that is, Maybe it's just family gatherings, or maybe it's gatherings with you and your four leggeds, whatever that happens to be. Death and dying and rebirth also means that sometimes after somebody passes, we are rebirthed. Maybe we switch up the traditions. Maybe we give birth to new traditions and we retire the old traditions. Maybe then it's our turn to create the new traditions. Maybe it's time to take grandma's cooking utensils and create our own recipes or new recipes. I like to watch Rachel Ray. Sometimes I get to see her and I like her. She's fun. So maybe we use new recipes in the old bowls. Sometimes we need to make new memories. If the memories that we've had growing up aren't necessarily pleasant holiday memories, it's okay to put those to rest, everybody. Again, not everybody has to be memorialized or remembered. Sometimes it's the end of an era. It's the end of a cycle. And a new cycle begins with new thoughts new music, right? A real tree instead of the old, you know, silver tree that's been around since the 60s, right? Get rid of that tinsel tree or that white tree with the disc of color that goes around and around. Get a real tree. That's okay, because you wanna know what? Very important to know. Those that we love who are on the other side, they get it. If we don't want to put up that silver tree from 1969, we don't have to, and they get it. If we don't want to hang those old ornaments on there that are all dilapidated and faded, it's okay. They understand that. 
If we want to cook, I don't know, salmon instead of a roast for Christmas dinner, they're okay with that too. They understand. And they also understand when we do want to keep the traditions alive. Does it hold them here to the earth plane? No. It holds fond memories. It holds love to the earth. If situations weren't loving, don't hold the unloving memories. Don't hold the unloving traditions. Let those go and make loving traditions. And if you would like to have signs from your relatives that they're around during the holidays, tell them. Hey, Dad, let me know that you're here. Oh, the other night I got a doozy. As I was driving into the Botanic Gardens with my husband, Todd, we were driving in and I was going to perform a wedding. Another one of my dad's favorite Christmas tunes is Mele Kaliki Maka, right? The Hawaiian Christmas song. Because you know what, as a little girl, we were on the island of Oahu and we heard that all the time during Christmas. And he used to sing it. And so as we're driving up so that I could perform the wedding for his grandson, my nephew, what song comes on the radio? Mele Kaliki Maka. And I knew that the Sarge was with us. And as I was performing the wedding for my nephew and his lovely new bride, Dana, and I looked across, you know, the little pathway there at the Frederick Meyer Garden, looking at my brother, Don, my father was standing right next to him. And I'm pretty sure that Don could probably feel the Sarge standing right there next to him. Our loved ones don't just show up for the holy days. They show up for mundane events. They show up for the special events, graduations, even kindergarten graduations, weddings, proms, all of those things, because they love us. They love us. Thanks, Dad, for letting me know that you're here. I knew in my heart of heart. <laughs> Mele Kaliki Maka. Me and my brother Don heard that song so many times living on the island. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that, Kel. Making new memories. Now we're making new memories with sledding parties and crab boils and all those kind of good things. Hey, Nikki Jorgensen. I'll be up there tomorrow, Heartful Art Studio. I can't say out loud what I'm making because the recipient of what I'm making at the Heartful Art Studio tomorrow is sitting right here in the studio office with me. But you know what I'm making, don't you, Nikki? <laughs> She's saying, I had a dream the other night sitting and conversing with Fawn. I woke up from the dream thinking, did I just dream that? Or was that real? Like it just happened yesterday. Beautiful. Yes, it was real. Very real. Any of you ever have that experience with a loved one in the dream time? And you're pretty sure that you just had a full-blown conversation. You could hear the voice. You could feel them. You could feel the emotion of it. Some people wake up laughing from those. Some people wake up crying from those. Those experiences are real when our body is at rest. And our brain is out of the way is oftentimes when our loved ones can step through so easily, so easily. This is why meditation, contemplation time, a walk in the forest, quiet time allows for those interactions, thoughts of love. When I'm having a session with somebody and I'll say, oh, well, there's a gentleman by this name here that's in the room. Who is that to you? And my client will say, oh, my goodness, I was thinking about them just today. How did they know that I was thinking about them, Denise? That's not why I'm here, but I was just thinking about them. Well, because they could feel you thinking about them. And if they are loving thoughts, those loving thoughts draw them near. The loving thoughts draw them near. If those that you love, some of them have gone home to spirit and you want them near during this time or any time, 
bring them in with loving thoughts, loving intentions. If they were not loving, do not feel obligated to bring them in. Let them go on their way. They are in their fullness of spirit. They are not in need of another Christmas celebration or another Hanukkah. They are in their fullness. However, if we are in need of spending time with them, having them with us to complete the celebration, invite them. Invite them with love. And pay attention. Be awake and aware. And for heaven's sakes, don't doubt yourself. When you think to yourself, could that have been? Did I just feel? Hey, that's their favorite song that just started on the radio. Could it be? The answer to that is yes. Could it be? It is. It is. You know, Mother Teresa, I love Mother Teresa. She was a really good human being, extraordinary human being, but human nonetheless. And she was the first to admit she was very human. But one thing that I read a long time ago from her was this, let, let everything that you do be done in love, including washing the dishes. And her thought about that was even when we wash the dishes and we're thinking about love, when we're folding our clothes, we're putting love into the clothing of our loved ones or ourselves. When we're cooking with love, as Kelly was talking about. When we do everything with love, walking the dog with love. Everything that we do with love draws love near us, to us, brings love out of us, and there's an alchemy. When you are putting your ornaments on the Christmas tree, if there are ornaments when you hang them and the thoughts are not loving, maybe they bring a not so fond memory, put that one away, at least for this year. It's okay to put it away. Even though it's been hanging on your tree for 40 years, it's okay to put it away and not hang it this year. Leave those that you can hang with love or that as you're hanging, you can feel the love. Not obligation, love. So I like the thought of people eating off of plates and things that I've washed with love. Vacuuming with love. Those of you that know me know how I am about clean floors, right? Sweeping with love. Vacuuming with love, with love, brings love. Yeah. And sometimes our loved ones on the other side send us love so that our thoughts are drawn to them as well. You know, Denise, all of a sudden I started thinking about mom. Where did that come from? Probably mom saying, I love you too. I'm thinking about you too. It's not a one-way street. Sometimes their love for us crosses the veil on that web, that weave of love. And we hear their call to us. And sometimes we can hear them right in our mind, our mind, right? We can hear them. Pay attention to that. That's real. The weave of love, the phone connection of love goes both ways. If it isn't, if it wasn't loving, if it isn't loving, let it be, let it go. Focus on the love. With that, everyone, thank you for being present with me this evening. Thank you for the love and uh, keeping you all in prayer and love every day and particularly throughout the holy days. Do it in love. Be with the love. Shine your light. Blessings be everybody. Good night.